Well, thank you for having us. Uh, it's just amazing uh, being here. I've been looking forward uh, to this camp for the last couple of months. I want to thank uh, Pastor Ronald, Pastor Jasmine, uh, the board members, the leadership team uh, for inviting us. Uh, we are so happy and uh, we've been looking forward. Uh, my wife, the other is the town. <laughs> and, uh, and my two kids, Hannah and Jordan, you know, uh, we were all excited. In fact, we, uh, we'll be at three camps in two weeks. Uh, we just finished our own church camp uh, just on Tuesday and then uh, we're here and then once we head back on Sunday, then Monday we'll be at another camp uh, where we'll be attending as guests actually uh, in, in KL. Uh, but it's just amazing and, 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 and uh, that, that we have time to just minister and you know, camps are wonderful because camps are the time where we get to receive from God. Camps are the time where God can speak to us, where we are less distracted because of uh, you know, work and busyness and life and different things and can come together, so it's just amazing. Uh, let's just pray before we start. Can we do that? Father, we want to thank you for today. We thank you for your grace, your mercy in our lives. We thank you because you're a good God. We thank you that you have great things in store for us in this camp. And so we commit to you our time together. Even in the next few sessions as we come together, Lord, we pray that you will take over, that you will speak to us, that we will hear your voice clearly, that we will not be the same, O oh God. Because whenever your presence is with us, whenever your word is being preached, whenever we encounter you, it is impossible for us not to be changed. It is impossible for nothing to happen, because surely something must happen and will happen, because you are in our midst. And so, Father, we pray that those who are struggling and going through difficult times, Father, we pray that you speak to them and to this camp touch and minister release your voice your word yes. those who are searching for direction that you would release your guidance those who are sick that you will heal that you will release oh god your grace and your mercy that we will be transformed to be like jesus we will draw closer to you and know exactly lord what you're saying to us in this season of our life and for this church of God. And for that, we thank you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. So you all had uh, uh, equal food already. I've heard some of you. Uh, so equal food, I saw. Can I go myself? Search 
across the regions where King Xerxes was, uh, was uh, reigning and to get this, uh, uh, as many beautiful ladies as possible basically to come. All right? And then comes Esther. So Esther was one of the ones that were chosen to be in the king's palace and she was preparing uh, to, to be one of the king's uh, 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 companions, so to speak. And we know the story took a deep turn where there's this second guy called Haman who came in the picture and just basically like an advisor to the king or the second man or the prime minister of the king and, and he's the one who's been crazy for power and he wanted recognition, he wanted to be respected and we're told in scripture that he wanted people to bow before him and there's this other character by the name of Mordecai which is actually Esther's cousin uh, but he's more like the father, the cousin, but their uh, age, they got eight different, but she's more like, like, he's more like the father, but he's the cousin actually who actually raised Esther up. And so Mordecai was, was one of the, he's a Jew of course, and when uh, this Haman character wanted uh, Mordecai and the rest of the people to bow before him, and Mordecai refused to bow before him, and uh, Haman was very upset. And therefore Haman began to uh, have this thought to say that, you know, uh, let's get rid of all the Jews. So that's where the story comes from, where we know that the story where he began to persuade the king to say, let's get rid of all the Jews, let's kill them, let's annihilate all of them. And Mordecai, being a Jew himself, was fighting for his people. And Mordecai came to Esther, I'm just cutting the story short, came to Esther and said, Esther, you are already in the palace, you have aligned to the king, can you do your part and go to the king and plead before the king so that he can reverse this ethic or this, this eating of this commandment to kill and to annihilate all the Jews. Can you do that? And Esther was saying that I can't just simply go to the king because if he doesn't call for me, you know, uh, um, the rule was that if the king doesn't call for you and you just go, then the king will kill you. <laughs> so you can't simply go. And it's in the context of this story that then we read Esther 414, which is the theme of your camp. Then Mordecai began to say to Esther and says, Look, Esther, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for, help me together, this together, for such a time as this. And so Mordecai was basically telling Esther, come on, Esther, I mean, Look at where you are right now, look at how things have been, you know, who knows? For such a time as this, you have been placed by God in this unique position, in this unique place of influence so that you can actually save all the Jews. And it's quite interesting because when you begin to, 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 to look at the book of Esther and how God raised Esther up, and, and I mean, the Bible was very clear in, in Esther 1 or 2, talking about her physical beauty. Because only the beautiful ladies, the girls, were selected to be part of this group. We were told in, uh, ex, uh, in Esther 2 that how she had favor among the people and she had favor uh, among the, uh, 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 in front of uh, the king. In fact, among all the other girls, she had the most favor. favor. So amazingly, and Mordecai is there, come on, look at where you are right now and how God has designed you. There is favor. Maybe, just maybe, it is not a coincidence. For such a time as this, you have been called so that you can deliver us. You know, we like to use the word coincidences, but as believers, uh, we, must be, we must believe in what we can call divine coincidences. <laughs> coincidences that seem to be coincidences, but they are not because they are divinely orchestrated by God for such a time as this so that his call, his purpose, his plans can be accomplished. Amen? Amen. Yes. Because the story of Esther is really about destiny, it's about call and purpose and how God in his divine timing and sovereignty would call a people, call an individual so that he or she can fulfill their call and destiny. You know, there's a story about camel, uh, uh, two camels, a mother camel and a baby camel. Uh, the baby camel came to the mother and says, Mom, uh, you know, I've got some questions. The baby camel told the mother, said, Mom, how come we have these weird humps? You know, camel humps, right? We've got these weird humps on our back. You know, the mother says, you know what, child, we are desert animals. And so the desert is hot. And the humps are important because the hump is where we store liquid. And whenever we are hot, the, the liquid from the uh, humps helps to 
hydrate it so we eat that. Oh, I see that. I see. Yes, how about mom? We have this long looking weird legs. Very cumbersome. Why do we have all these long legs? And the mom told the baby camel, you know, we have these long legs because we are desert animals. And in the desert, the sand is thick. And we need these long legs to be moving around. It's for mobility. And the baby camel said, oh, we are desert animals. Therefore, we have these long legs. Then the baby camel said, mom, how about these long, funny looking eyelashes that we have? Sometimes it blurs my vision, you know, and it's, you know, it looks funny as well. But why do have these long eyelashes? And then the mother told the child, baby camel say, you know, we are desert animals. And so when we're in the desert, the wind will blow and the sand will, will, will can't enter the eyes, and therefore the long eyelashes are supposed to protect us from sand entering our eyes. And the baby camel say, okay, I get it. Um, the hum, because we're desert animals, is meant to provide us with uh, hydration and the um, Legs are long because we're desert animal and we need to travel in the sand. And the eyelashes is because we're desert animal and it's to prevent the sand from coming into our eyes. Then the baby said, Mom, if you're desert animal, then why on earth are we doing it this soon? <laughs> <laughs> See, there's a principle called the principle of design, the principle of calling. Where how God has designed us and how God has called us, and we're supposed to function in precision in terms of where God has actually placed us. What is the call of God? The call of God is basically God's predetermined design for our lives. It is that which we were actually created to do, to function in the place that we're supposed to be in. In God's divine sovereignty, His call is that He uniquely designed someone with different talent, different giftings, put in different passion, there's a spiritual DNA somehow embedded into each and every one of us. And he will place us in certain positions, certain roles, certain capacities, in certain geographical areas at a certain time and season, so that we will fulfill his will for his glory. Amen? Amen. That's the call of God. There is a call of God and in each of our lives so that we can fulfill His purpose, His destiny for us. Psalm 139 is pretty sweet. The psalm is pretty sweet. Um, he says, David says, for you, created, for you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed body all the days I ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I love this verse. It says, You created me in my inmost being. It says, You knit me together in my mother's womb. You know, we know we think. How many of you, any, any ladies here, you knit? Well, we have that. Yeah, that is. Okay. Any men who knit? <laughs> you know, knitting is a slow process, am I right? It's not just like instantaneous, you're not buying off the shelf, you need and it takes time to need. You can needing a blanket, you can needing a sweater. You've seen some ladies need and you did a lot of work, am I right? And different colours and they will need and they will need. You know, whatever you are needing, you're needing something that you have thought of and it's nothing and you're slowly needing it so that it becomes something. Does that make sense? And so the scripture tells us when God created us, it wasn't just like, boom, that's it. There was a time, and a time of course in God's economy is different. For him, one second could be just, but in God's mind, he took time, so to speak, to, to form us precisely with passion, with talents, with gifting, giftings. He needed us in our mother's womb. And I love this verse because this verse then tells me that even before I was born, I was in my mother's womb, God had me in mind. And He specifically designed me in the way He wanted me to become. Yes. Amen? Yes. And then it says in verse 16, Your eyes saw my unformed body, before my body was formed. All the days, all the days ordained for me, all the days that were supposed for me in the future, so to speak, were written in your book before one of them came to be. Meaning God has a book that He would have written way ahead of time what our days and what we will do and what will become even before we came who we were. It's, it's sort of like what strategic plan. 
know, in work, in business, we write strategic plan, marketing plan, and then plan ahead. We say, you know, next year we're going to do this campaign, we're going to plan for this program, and, and you plan ahead what you'll do. And, and it's like God, when we were in our mother's school, God had this plan, and He would plan our lives precisely. See, every creator, before he or she creates something, has in, has in, has in mind uh, what that particular creation ought to be and for what particular function. I mean, take for example the phone, right? Uh, or you are a phone, or you are a smartphone. Anybody still not using a smartphone? Please don't raise your hand, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I think I can see one hand behind there. We'll pray for you after the service, alright? <laughs> You know, there are many functions in the smartphone, would you agree? Would you agree? Literally, I don't know, easily 30, 40, 50 functions in handphone. But most of you only use a couple of functions. Right? You only use a couple of functions. Uh, but the designers had in mind when they designed the handphone saying that, you know, I'm going to put in this, I'm going to put in that, I'm going to put in this, so that this phone will, will, will fulfill the fullness of its potential. And yet many of us don't fully utilize our phones. We only use it for calling, we use it for WhatsApp, and maybe surf the internet, and that's it. But there are so many other functions, so many other apps that we can use. So similarly, I think many at times when we talk about calling and destiny, we don't fully fulfill or enter into the fullness of what God wants us to do because we don't understand calling. We need to rise to our calling. We don't understand purpose. We can miss the things that God is speaking to us because we're so, doing, so busy doing other things that seem to be right but may not be of God. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But God designed it and He's fashioned and He's fashioned and he planned us so that we can be precisely who he has called us to be. Now let's take a step back, right? And let's think about what is purpose. Now purpose is very simple. All of us, okay, because this is a question that people usually ask, what's my purpose? What is God's will for me? Right? Let's take a step back and, and just look at it from a very simple perspective first because all of us have one very simple purpose which according to 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it tells us, so whatever, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, it tells us, do it all for the glory of God. Whether you eat, you drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And so with this, we understand one thing. Our purpose, our calling is very simple. In a very simple manner to put it, it is that all of us, our purpose, our calling is to glorify God. Whatever that we do in life is to glorify God. <clears throat> then we chuck into something deeper and it says, okay, how do we glorify God? Very simple. We glorify God by just doing His will. Doing the will of God. So generally, God's purpose is for me is to, for example, to serve Him. I know by serving God, I glorify Him. Do you agree with me? Yeah, by serving God, I glorify Him. But then we have to ask a deeper question, how should I serve God? In what capacity should I serve God? You know, as we begin to grow, as believers, as Christians, we begin to mature, we realize that, mm, okay, serving God is fine. You know, but when we begin to grow, there could be specific functions, specific, specific roles that God has called me to be. You now, I remember when I was uh, very passionate about, I got saved when I was 16, you know, uh, uh, God said, I was baptized in Bozeman when I was 16, but when I was, he's, he's a teenager in church, I was very active serving, you know, anything that they asked me to do, so I do it. Because so passionate, so, you know, as a deed, I'll just do everything. But then as I began to mature and understand calling and destiny, I actually began to say, to, to say no to many things and say yes to just a few things in ministry. Because I felt like that those are the things that God has called me to do specific giftings, specific talents that God has placed in me. So, we know God's call for us generally is to glorify Him, but then we also need to know the specific will of God in our lives, our vocation, our jobs, which is, by the way, which is the most spiritual vocation, well, which is the most spiritual vocation. Well, you're very smart, no, I'm checking that. <laughs> Don't you say pastor, okay? The most spiritual vocation is the vocation that God has called you to become, to be. Amen? Amen. If 
God has called you to become a doctor, that's your most spiritual vocation now. If God has called you to be an engineer, so that's your most spiritual vocation. If God has called you to be a teacher, that's your that's your, your bullseye. Specifically, God would have called us to do certain things for Him because He has called us uh, you know, to, to, to glorify Him specifically. In fact, Jesus said this way in the book of John. Jesus says that my food is to do the will of God. Remember in John? Jesus says my food is to do the will of God. Jesus equated doing the will of God to eating food. When you don't eat food, you die. <laughs> so you can understand the analogy that Jesus was using. He was saying that, come on, the thing that really sustains me in life is doing God's will. In fact, let's put it the other way around. If you don't do God's will, something dies in us. Something dies in us. But we do do God's will. There is a death. I'm not talking physical death. But something dies. Because we were all designed uniquely by God to function in a way in specific areas so that we can glorify Him. That's why the enemy comes in and he often wants to divert us from fulfilling the call, the will of God in our life. He comes in many forms. The scripture describes the enemy in John 10 as the one that will come and steal, to kill, and to destroy. I mean, the enemy is real. Whether you like it, you don't like it, we are all in spiritual warfare. Daily in our lives. Daily in our lives. He comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. The enemy's role is to just ensure we don't fulfill God's call. He comes to steal. I call this the progressive, destructive nature of the evil one. He steals. After he steals not enough, he kills. After he kills, he destroys, nothing left. So the enemy, when he comes against us, like he's all out on. He's really all out. Alright? And we need to be mindful that he comes so that he can steal the destiny and the plans that God has for us. In fact, literally in scripture, even in the in, in the book of Esther, you know, God's chosen people, we know the Jews are God's chosen people, and the enemy tried to annihilate all of them through Haman to kill all the Jews and it's not the first time right? we see repeatedly in history of the world that for whatever reason she cannot explain this if someone can explain this tell me why people have such intense hatred for the Jews hatred for the Jews you cannot explain you know why because it's spiritual right. there's no logical reason why so many people hate the Jews <laughs> except it's spiritual so they want to kill the Jews and, and they want to kill the Jews and then in uh, when Moses was born, remember? Pharaoh wanted to kill all the babies. When Jesus was born, they wanted to kill all the babies. So the devil is always all out trying to destroy, to steal, to kill, and destroy. And so our job then as we begin to pursue God is also to learn to protect our call. To protect that which God has called us to become. And that's very important. Because you know, being in, in, in ministry for quite a number of years, I realized that some people are careless in the way that they live their lives and not careful with the way that they make decisions. And then suddenly you look at them and say, what happened to this guy? And you see that he's actually away from what God has called him or her to become. Because we have not jealously protected and guarded the will of God, the call of God in our life. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 9, um, it says in this way, it says, Be alert, the scripture wants, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Be alert means we must be vigilant, we must be on the lookout. It says, Be sober. Sober means opposite is don't be drunk, right? Sober means you're thinking clearly, you're seeing clearly, there's a certain clarity. You must see clearly. Be alert, be sober. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, stand firm in the faith. The enemy prowls. You know the word prowls means he goes in a stealth mode. Stealth mode means quietly. Have you seen those documentary when there's a little deer or something and the lion or the tiger is slowly prowling? So he hides in the bush, the high grass cannot be seen, and he's slowly prowling, prowling quietly in stealth mode, and suddenly he attacks. And that's the picture that scripture has given us that, giving us that the enemy comes and he prowls, meaning 
If the enemy were to deceive us, he would deceive us in a way that you and I don't want to be deceived. In a way, it will be small little things, small little compromises, small little decisions. It could be offenses. It could be sin in our lives that we don't realize. It could be certain trials and tribulations that we don't respond correctly to. And therefore, decisions that are made sway us away from the call and destiny that God has for us. So we need to be mindful of this and then tell ourselves, how can I protect the call of God? If God has called me, then I need to protect the call of God. I need to, be, to, to embrace the call of God. We need to value the call of God. Because all of us are special. We are special. Let no one tell you that you are normal. Because all of us are not normal. <laughs> In a good way. Eh? Don't tell me you're not normal. <laughs> we are extraordinary. God made us that way. Because if you and I understand that we are so uniquely designed by God, even in our mother's womb, God has knitted us, deposited certain things in us. We are so special to sign. <clears throat> then surely we live our lives very differently. Because now there's purpose. Now there's destiny. Now there's meaning. Because we're living for the law. And then we're going to learn to protect the call of God that is in our life. The call of God that is in the church. The call of God that is in a nation. I mean, you think of a nation, for example. You know, does everybody love Malaysia here? Yeah. You think God has forsaken our nation? No. Of course not. You know, Malaysia has a call. There's a call of God upon this land. No matter whatever, whatever uh, different situation or circumstances that we see around us that's happening and that causes us to be discouraged, but we never give up because we know when Jesus died on the cross, He also died for Malaysians, you know. He died for this nation, amen? And surely, the nation has a call. God has a redemptive purpose for this land. And so we don't give up. That's why we keep praying. There's a huge prayer movement that's been on for the last couple of years, am I right? We keep praying, we keep interceding. Why? Because we believe that God has a call upon this land. That God has a call upon this church, your church. We keep interceding, we keep praying, we keep fighting. Why? Because we know that call needs to be fulfilled. Yes. Tabernacle of praise needs to fulfill your call, your destiny, your purpose as a church. Yes. We need to embrace that call in our lives. And many times, you know, when the call comes, whatever that God is calling us to do, sometimes we, we may not hear or we may not understand the call. Now let me just say that in verse number one, knowing God's call is also not that difficult. Okay, number one, if you're a father, for example, how many fathers can I say yes? How many fathers have? Okay, excellent, right? Now knowing God's call for you is not, not difficult as a father. You just be the most godly father you can be. Can you say amen? That's it. Alright, if your mother, you'll be the most godly mother there is. If you're working right now as an employee, then you'll be the most godly hard-working employee there is. Amen? If God has given you a certain giftings, because the gifting and the talent of God which always comes together, and many times our call can be found in our gifting and talents, and our passion, sorry, our talents and our passion. You know what your talent that, your gift that, very likely your talent and your gifting is tied to your call. If you're passionate about something, very passionate about something, you have a burden for a certain ministry or certain work or certain thing, very likely the passion it's not just a passion that you have because you have it. Very likely the passion comes from God. You could have passion for children, passion for the nation, passion to intercede, passion for, for, for the poor, whatever it is. When your talent meets your passion, it comes together, you're in the sweet spot. God's called in your life. You know, I grew up in my church. I was in my church, Pastor Ron was saying, I was in my church since I was nine years old, all right? And uh, so, 30 over years already, right? I'm, uh, how old am I? <laughs> 29, oh, thank you. <laughs> My daughter is 15, so I got married at uh, 16, is it? 13, is it? <laughs> No, I'm 45. Okay, I know, I know, right? I look like an 
I part time I sell this cream. How to look young? Okay? <laughs> you want? You come and see me, alright? So, <laughs> but ever since I was nine, I was in the church. I grew up in the church. Love God. Love to serve. <laughs> you know, I've been. Mean, uh, uh, I've done everything. I'm one of those that done everything, right? From uh, ushering to sweeping the floor to uh, operating the. Last time it's called the transparency. Some of you know what I'm talking about, but okay. Operate the transparency, write the transparency, rub the transparency, everything, right? So, we've done everything. I was the youth leader, right? Then when I was, uh, I, I came back from my uni studies, uh, I was a, a, a board member in my church, you know? So, very passionately, I was teaching, already, I was preaching. And, and my pastor, uh, Reverend Joyce Williams, and, and, and wonderful lady, and she was looking for, of course, they were planning for, for a successor. And they've always had me in mind, you know. So they said, you know, we want you. And she and the board member says, you know, we feel that you're the right one. This was so active in church, you know, doing everything. It's just you're the right one, and we want you to set the call of God in your life. And because along the way, there were many uh, prophetic words as well. Prophetic words. There were easily three or four prophetic words along the line of teaching, preaching, about being a pastor. Some very accurate one, like pastor, like also accurate. So like specific, like very specific, like you're, you're going to call to be a pastor and stuff like that, you know. And so along the years, they've been like wooing me. They said, come on, we want you to come into full-time ministry and be a pastor in this church. And I've, I've, I've never felt the peace to go into ministry. Never felt. Never felt. So I told them, no, it's not for me. You know, I don't think. But the other thing is that I love the church. I love ministry. I love to serve. I have this huge desire and passion from last time right up to now to build the church. I know. You know, I love the church. I just love church stuff. All right? That my hobby is church. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? My hobby is church. But go full time as a pastor? No. I, I just. It's not me. It's not me. I don't know whether it's contradictory or not. But it's not me. It's not me. So I said no. I said no, it's not me because I don't feel the call, the call of God. And so I did it. So I started to work. And then we had very good advices in the church who came to the church and said, okay, fine. You know, Eric, maybe he don't want to go full-time, it's okay, but maybe we help to transition him. <laughs> Alright? So let's, uh, then they mooted the idea of me becoming a bivocational pastor. Bivocational means not full-time. So while I hold a job, then I am a pastor as well. So after some time, then, you know, I agreed. So I was a bivocational pastor in my church uh, in my late 20s. I think, was it early 30s? So my numbers are a bit wacky, right? So, uh, you know, well, this is like 15 years ago. Some yeah. company for me, 15, 45 minus 15, that's 30. 30, yeah. So, so when I was about 30, I was a bivocational pastor, one of the pastors in church, one among four pastors in church. All right? I was, the, I was uh, not full time, so the others were full time, including my senior pastor. So I functioned as a bivocational pastor for many years. Yeah. And then, of course, my pastor was saying that it's time for her to hand over. She wants to move on to do different things, and we're looking for someone to succeed her. And um, and they came to me again and says, "One and all." <laughs> I said, "No." So I don't feel God has called me into full-time ministry. You know, that's not my passion. No, I love the marketplace. And you know, I'm doing well here and stuff like that. And then, so the church, you know, actually hired some people in with the intention of getting. This particular person, actually, if one person was hired in to actually transit into becoming a senior pastor, but it didn't work. It didn't work. So nothing worked. All right, and then it came back to me. And our church advisor came to get our church board. They say, "Hey, it is possible for there to be a bivocational senior pastor position. It's possible. All right, it's possible." And then begin to share that in Singapore. It's a very uh, the model has been adopted in, in the West, in Australia, in the US, it's the same. In Malaysia, not really heard of at that time. All right? And to cut the story short, when they say it, it is possible to become a bi-professional senior master, actually in my heart, I knew it was possible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. In my heart, I knew it was possible. Not only that, in my heart, I already wanted it. Mm. That was the easiest decision for me to make. You know, 15 years prior, when they wanted to install me as a pastor, I said, no, because you know, become a pastor is scary, right? <laughs> I said, they want, they, want, they want to pray and fast and stuff like that. 
But when the time came and they said that we want you to take over as a bi-vocational senior pastor because you know God has really worked in my heart for a long time. It was very easy for me to say yes because I was actually prepared to and I knew and I had such a love for the church. And so I said yes, coming into that position as a pastor. So for the last six years, I have been the senior pastor of my church. The last six years, I'm the senior pastor. And it was something that I didn't really expect in a sense because in our mind, it wasn't normal. It wasn't normal. If I'm not mistaken, I think I'm the only AG by vocational senior pastor right now. If I'm not mistaken, right now. You know, and, and so it wasn't normal. Of course, the process was more tedious. We had to go to a general council, talk to Reverend Hong Sik Lang, you know, uh, you know and, and, and amazingly, everything was very smooth. That's how I came into the ministry six years ago. Never regretted it right after today. <laughs> Alright, and, and again, God has used different different people speaking to me and different signs and, and you know and, and I wouldn't have time, but the fruit that we have seen yes. is just amazing. See the call of God always comes to our lives and it's always very clear in it's precision in terms of what God wants us to do. But it may not be clear to us because sometimes God will download everything. You know what I'm saying? And, and for me, it was like becoming a pastor because at the time, right? becoming a pastor means full time. You know, I've never wanted to become a pastor. Tell the truth. Right? Even today, right? you ask me to go full time, I cannot. I cannot. Because it's just not me. It is just not me. It is just not me. So I'm staying faithful to my call and, and I and I have to wrestle through that. I have to wrestle through that because people come and ask me and say, you don't want to go full time because money, right? Come on, I'm just being real with you. You know, prior to that, when I was by, before I was by vocational, one of my board members, this is like more than 10 years ago, this, this person is no longer board member. You know, in a board meeting, he says, Yes, Eric, you do this. Don't worry, we'll pay you. We'll pay you 5,000 ringgit. This is like more than 15 years ago. That's like, wow, a lot of money at that time. That time I was probably only earning maybe 2, 3,000. We'll pay you 5,000 ringgit. Then we we'll get you a church car. Now he was, he was trying to entice me. You know? <laughs> some, some boy was that one, huh? Okay. Oops. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. You know, because we love the Lord, so we try. You know, and I was, I'm thinking, by my heart, I said, no, that's not how I'm cut to be. And I have to be very honest with myself because I say that, you know, it is not the money. Because if it's the, if it's the money that I'm not going full time, then I'm the worst pastor ever. Because then I can know right to stand in front of my congregation and tell them, sacrifice for God, give your time, give your money to God, go all out, concentrate your lives. But myself, I am going to go full time because I want money. Now, the most hypocritical pastor ever. You know what I'm talking about? I had to be true to myself and know what God has called me to do. Right? By the way, my, my job right now is I run my own company. I'm a corporate trainer, leadership trainer, leadership consulting consultant. That's what I do. I go to organizations. I train primarily on leadership, soft skill stuff, and consulting on leadership stuff. And what I do at work and in church a lot has to do with the calling and the giftings of God in my life. And so I see, I see the word is congruence. I see a congruence of my work and my ministry. We need to embrace the call of God in life. Because the call of God is the purpose and the will of God that is in life. When we begin to embrace the call of God, we actually glorify God, we said earlier. And the other thing happens is that we actually, our lives become meaningful because right now, we are bearing fruit. I believe it is possible for any one of us, anybody, it's possible to live a fairly successful life in terms of maybe financially, your good health, You've got friends, you've got a nice family, everything going well for you and living a fairly successful life, but completely miss God. Yeah. It's possible. It's possible. Yeah. And you have to 
day when we begin to we may face God. And God will ask us what we have actually done that actually bear spiritual fruit. So that's why in the book of uh, Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul teaches it this way. He says, We have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of His will. Look at that. We ask God to give you what? Complete knowledge of His will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. So the prayer was that we are praying that God will give you complete knowledge of His will. That should be the prayer of every single one of us. Is God, download to me the complete knowledge of your will for my life. Help me understand precisely what you called me to do so that your will can be done in my life. Verse 10 says this, then, that means referring to when we know the will of God, am I right? Verse 10 says, then, when you know the will of God, then, the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. Amen. That's the fruit. So knowing God's will will affect the way that we live our lives. And we, when we live our lives in the will of God, it brings Him honor, it pleases Him, it bears fruit. Everybody say fruit. fruit. And that's where God is glorified in our life. Fruit bearing. That's why I said it's possible to have a certain level of success and yet not bear spiritual fruit. It's true. But when we embrace the fall of God, not only will we bear fruit, the next thing is that there will be a certain clarity in our lives. Clarity is very important. Clarity is the ability to see clearly. Clarity is when we begin to see clearly the way God sees things. The way God views us. It is about being in the center of God's will. You know, some of us, we know we live our lives, could be running around like headless chicken. <laughs> doing this, doing that, doing this, doing that, you know. You know, when I talk to my church members, sometimes we pastor them, we counsel them. You know, when I see a guy moving from job to job to job to job, you know, I'll just stop and say, you know, stop, pause, pray. Don't simply just resign because the fill up you 20% more. Just sit back, pray, ask God's will to be done. Then when you know it's God's will to place you in the next organization, then you move. Then that's clarity. You don't have to move from job to job to job and then what drives the decision is that the other guy pays you more money. Because you can have more money but no fruit. But you can stick at your current job at the precise position and place, divinely connected to the people that God wants you to be connected right now in your circle or in your job, in your church, in your cell group, whatever it is. And then bear fruit. So there will be a certain clarity that we know God's will that will help us to make decisions. And we are always making those decisions where we're hitting bull's eye, bull's eye, bull's eye. You know, how much time, think about it, how much time is wasted when we don't do God's will? How much time is wasted? Precious time. You know, we, we cannot speed up time. We cannot, we cannot, uh, uh, Scripture says, redeem the time. Meaning that we make every minute, every second count. You know, some of us have regrets in our life. How many have regrets in our life? The regrets? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I shouldn't have done this. Uh. I shouldn't have done that. You now, God can redeem all our wrongs and all our regrets. He can redeem on His gracious. But I wish sometimes we wouldn't have wasted time. Not only time, emotional energy. And sometimes when we are not doing what we're supposed to do, we get into the mess. Relational strain and you know talking about strife and emotional energy and hurt. And so a lot of heartaches happen because we don't do that which we were supposed to do. But when we are in the center of God's will, rising to a call, 
than his gravity. You know, my mom, uh, she's very nice. When I was younger, as a youth, you know, and she wasn't very regular in church last time, you know, not so spiritual, uh, but now she's an intercessor, right? She's my intercessor, you know. She came to me one day and says, Eric, and she why are you in why are you in Because the church was very small last time, maybe 60 people or whatever. He said, why are you in this church? He says, you are so gifted, you can play the guitar, you can sing, you can talk so well, you should go to a bigger church. Go to a bigger church, then you've got more exposure, more... You know, that's the kind of advice you'll give, right? Why stay in this little China Mac company? <laughs> go to a multinational, that's where you can build your career. That is good advice. But how many of you know that good doesn't necessarily mean God? But I, don't, I didn't, at, 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 I think when my mom spoke to me, I was about 15 and 16. But at 15 and 16, I could actually tell my mom, this is where God placed me. I just knew it. This is where God placed me. And so I've been in my church since I was nine. I'm, a, I'm proudly a son of the house. <laughs> like I said, my hobby is church. I could tell that this is where God placed me. This is where God has called me. You know, off and on we have people coming to our church right now. And, and, and we have a lot of uh, people from other churches coming to our church. <laughs> you know, and, and of course we want to grow and we want to win the loss. But people from other churches who come to our church, you know. And I tell the truth when I see them. You know, I don't reject them, of course. Huh? Because if I reject them, they come to our church, they go to somewhere else. Right? Because they don't want to go to their church for whatever reason. But one thing when I get to talk to them, I will always say this. I say, hey, thanks for coming. Huh? Uh, thanks for coming. Really, you know, appreciate you visiting our church today. And they were there. Oh, I'm from this church, this church. I said, oh, okay, okay. No, thanks for coming. You know, pray about it where God wants you to be. Pray about it. Huh? So that you know, whenever you know where God places you, then you know that's where your heart is. And then you will function there. You will serve there. Because now I'm talking to not new Christians. I'm talking to people who have been in other churches for a long time. Yeah. So I tell them, you pray about it where God wants you to go. Because I want them to find their own call and destiny. If God called them to stay in their church and go back up, if God can to go to another church and go to another church now. Because if they are meant to stay in their church, go to another church. But they stay in my church, they catch up. <laughs> Some of us pastors know the worst people are the ones from other church who are disappointed they come to your church and they bring this one to your church. <laughs> so I say, you pray about it, ask God to guide you. And I just in fact, almost every single person that I meet that I know is from another church, I will say that to them. If I get to meet them on Sunday, just brief conversations, hi, I will say that to them. Because we need clarity. If you know that you're clear where God has placed you, in your job, in your career, in your vocation, then you know that you cannot be wrong. Because not only when we are in the center of God's will, we bear fruit, not only that will be clarity. The next thing is that when we are in the center of God's will and you embrace God's call in your life, then there is the power to persevere through. That's the power to persevere through, especially in difficult times. You know, in our church, uh, whenever a couple wants to get married, we, we, like many churches, of course, we, we help them to go through marriage counseling. In our church, the marriage, marriage counseling process takes about eight months. Right, and we go through like 10 lessons, you know, like 8 months, everything from handling money, you know, uh, in-laws, or outlaws, you know, you know, everything else, communication, conflicts, you know, everything that we go through. And, and it's a very tedious process, and right now, we still have capacity, but future we're not sure, but now, right now we do one-to-one. -one. We don't do mass, one-to-one -one means one couple to one couple. And the reason we go through such a painstaking process with the couples, especially the first couple of lessons, first half of the marriage counseling, we try to drill, drill, drill to the point to say, okay, you love each other more than you love each other, more than you like each other, more than you want to get married, you better know that you are called into this marriage. We want them to establish that and understand that. You know what? Because after when they get married, when they start to quarrel, start to fight, when it gets really ugly, 
นอกจากนั้นดอสอัลบีเบลีอัลบีบอลแดนเบียร์ดูสิไม่ต้องเข้าใจยากไม่ต้องเข้าใจยากเท่าไหร่ไม่ต้องเข้าใจว่าสิ่งที่มันมีในชีวิตเป็นสิ่งที่มันไม่ได้เข้าใจไม่ต้องเข้าใจว่าสิ่งที่มันมีในชีวิตเป็นสิ่งที่มันไม่ได้เข้าใจไม่ต้องเข้าใจว่าสิ่งที่มันไม่ได้เข้าใจไม่ต้องเข้าใจว่าสิ่งที่มันไม่ได้เข้าใจ Let's get this thing done from him. Why? Because of the call. So we understand God's call, then we stick to it. No matter how tough, how difficult times can be, we stick to it because God's call anchors us in and brings us to a place of commitment and perseverance. No, I meet many pastors always. Whenever they meet me, the first question they ask is, "How do you do it? How do you do it? How do you do it? How do you work together? How do you do it? You know, you know. I say, how do you work together for the church? I say, all those things are the, the, you know, are are challenging, but they're not difficult. I say, not difficult. But I told them the main thing, what, why I'm doing what I'm doing. The main thing is because of the call. Because I know that this is what God has called me to do in this season. This time in my life, Amen. Amen. That's the call of God. You know the story of Esther that we, which is the theme of this camp, has a good ending because we know at the end what the enemy intended for evil. God turned it around, and Haman, who was the bad guy, was trying to kill all the Jews. He himself was exposed, yeah. and then he himself was killed, right? And then Mordecai rose up to, to take his place as the prime minister. Queen Esther became Queen Esther. Had a good story, good ending. Why? Because one woman dared to rise up and to understand and to embrace the calling that is in her life. Our call is precious. Our call is very personal. In Esther four fourteen, as we close, I'm just going to get happy. This thing is. It says, "For if you, Mordecai was telling Esther, it says, 'For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. Then who knows? You'll come for such a time as this, right? But Mordecai, when Mordecai was trying to convince Esther to go and see the king, look at Mordecai's faith." Mordecai was saying, if you remain silent at this time, if it's Esther, if you don't want to go, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Meaning that even if you don't go, Esther, no worries, because God will still save us. But Mordecai says, you and your family will die, right? Because you may be killed. But somehow God will still find a way to save the people. So in a sense, on one hand, God wants to use Esther. That's a calling. You understand? For such a time as this, am I right? On the other hand, don't have Esther also care. What's the problem? I'm saying this to encourage us because, see, God is never limited by our response. God wants to use us, but He didn't need. He doesn't need us. Does that make sense? He's not limited, but yet He wants to use us. We are very unique. If you don't do the job, or you don't rise up to your call, it's not a problem, because God is not limited by our ability. Someone else will do it, can even do it better. Or someone else will do it, don't do it better. Also, never mind. God is still in charge anyway. So God is never limited by man's ability. Am I right? But at the same time, God still pursues that man or woman to say, "I want you to do it." That's the pursuing of God in our lives, and He pursues us. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You fit every piece, and there's one piece left. Only that piece can go to that piece. That that piece can go into that empty slot. Am I right? No other piece. I was very encouraged because you know my 
Church advisor was the Dominic Asta. This is he's from Singapore. He was telling us, he was telling me. He was using this illustration to say, you know, but that peace is supposed to be you. Uniquely designed so that you can fulfill God's call that study, and that peace is yours, and you put it there. It's actually for you. If you don't want, never mind. God can create another jigsaw puzzle and use other people. That's right. But it's for us. It's for us. So I said earlier, it is possible that we can live very successful lives, but yet completely miss God. Sometimes we, I think we live our lives a bit too carelessly. Not knowing or seeking the Lord's will in our life. I don't mean that, you know, we have to wake up in the morning and say, God, what shirt should I wear this morning? Blue or green? Your call, please. I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying that, you know, in some of these major things in our life, we are too casual in the way that we make decisions. And when we are too casual, actually it points to one thing, which is about how we view Jesus as the Lord of us. Because it's a question of logic. If He is Lord, if He is King, then I will go to Him and say, God, I want to hear your voice. I want to fulfill your call in my life. Speak to me. Direct me. If he is not, if he's not God, he's not king, then I'll say, oh, this guy gave me 10% more. It makes sense. Oh, this is a good business deal. I'll just jump into it. Oh, this is a nice church because the music is good. Let me go to this new church now. You know what I'm saying? It's a question of submission to the Lordship of Jesus. It's about us coming to a place where we say, God, I don't want to miss you. Because when we miss God, we may miss certain dynamics or some of the clear things that He wants to do in our life. Missing the call, the purpose, the destiny of God. So tonight as we close, and I want to close with a time where we pray, a time where we dedicate ourselves to God and say, God, I dedicate myself to you. I recognize that you have called me you have placed a special destiny in my life. There are things that you have called me to do. You have placed certain gift things in my life so that I can fulfill your purpose in me. Help me hear your voice. Help me be obedient. To obey you, to hear your voice. Let's stand to our feet right now. Just stand. And maybe the musicians can help with some worship. Just where you are, you just look to him. Let it be a realignment. Alignment in your heart to say, God, I want to align my heart with your heart. I want to hear your voice. I want your will to be done in my life. I want to rise up to your calling in my life. It is not just about having a comfortable life or living a successful life. But it's about me fulfilling your call and your destiny in my life. And I don't miss that. Because when I know that I am the sweet spot of your call in my life, then I will bear fruit. Then I will bear fruit and then I will fulfill your destiny and then I will be blessed. So tonight, where you are, if that's you, you're saying that I want God's call to fulfill my life. I want to embrace the fullness of everything that God has called me to be. I want to make my life count. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand where you are. 
I see those hands. Very quick. Those hands.